long. And uh, thank you guys so much. I want to begin this morning by reading a poem. This is William Ernest Henley. He wrote the poem Invictus a little more than a hundred years ago. He writes, Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Life certainly would test such a boast. The passage we're going to look at this morning will test that claim. I want us to think for a moment about life. The various things that you and I experience, the happenings and events and circumstances that we encounter in this thing called life. There are times perhaps where you have laughed boisterously at a well-told joke where you have seen the tears of pain of a child who skins his knee on the pavement. I've been to a birthday party of a friend who turned 102 years old. I read about a volcanic eruption that melted the snow and caused a mudslide to swallow a whole town and kill all of its inhabitants. One day, you're with friends and having fun. And the next day, no one wants to be your friend at all. I've been in a football stadium with 102,000 people cheering on the University of Tennessee football team. And I had friends in a high school in Tennessee whose dear friends were killed in a car accident on their way home from school. You've enjoyed great meals and fun times. And a gunman opens fire on children at a McDonald's in a mall. We experience an almost ironic conglomeration of moods, occurrences, feelings, and events. See, things that don't seem to fit together. And yet they often occur side by side. Celebration and mourning. Laughter and crying. Birth and death. How are we to make sense of it all? What is this all about? Is, is there any meaning to the seemingly random series of unconnected events? And what is our place in the inexorable march of moments, dotted with an incomprehensible mix of joys and sorrows, all of it culminating in death? I want to read for us this morning another poem, this one penned by God through a king, the wisest man who ever lived. King Solomon in Ecclesiastes 3. Will you follow along with me as I read the first 11 verses? Here's Solomon's words. There is an appointed time for everything. And there is a time for every event under heaven. A time to give birth and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. A time to search and a time to give up as loss. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear apart and a time to sew together. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? I have seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. He has made everything beautiful in its time. 
He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. Will you pray with me this morning as we study this? God, we come to this, your word, so thankful that Ecclesiastes is in our Bibles, so thankful that Solomon recorded not only his extravagant experiment with life, but also his findings and his repentance. Thank you, O oh God, for the tension that has been written here that reveals the tension we feel in our own hearts about life that surrounds us, the complexities that engulf us. Oh God, we would tremble, but not for some calibration of our hearts through your truth. Surely we would go mad if we could not know the answer. God, I thank you for your wisdom. Guide us this morning as we study your word. May it lead us to you. Cause us to long for the eternity that you have set within us. And may you be glorified as we even rejoice in the beautiful canvas that you are painting, which is life. And we ask it in Jesus' name. The word time shows up 31 times in the text we're looking at this morning. Time is a precious commodity. Once you lose it, you can't get it back. And time itself is sweeping all of us relentlessly forward. And the older you get, perhaps the more you want to dig in your heels, slow it down, recover what was lost. You've become accustomed to me referencing 20th century poetry set to music. <laughs> Those are our philosophers, right? You might expect me to say something like, time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. Or maybe I might quote Jim Croce's time in a bottle, right? He said, if I could save time in a bottle, and then he talks about the things he'd like to do. He says, there never seems to be enough time to do the things you want to do once you find them. I've been around enough to know that you're the one I want to go through time with. And he wrote those words in a song, intending them for his wife. He left us the song, and he left his wife a letter, which she did not receive until after his death. And the letter said that he wanted to quit music, get out of public life, and give attention to his wife and their young son. He said that after this last tour, the Life and Times tour, he would stay home. And on that tour, his plane crashed, and with four of his friends, stepped into eternity. The letter he left for his wife and the song that he left for the rest of us are almost prophetic lamentations of the progress of time and the unseemly combinations of joys and tragedies that mark our earthly existence. I'm not going to quote the song that the birds made popular in 1965. Turn, turn, turn. To everything, there's a season. And I'm not going to quote it for two reasons. Number one, copyright infringement. Uh, I'm concerned uh, about where they got the lyrics. You see, the birds did not write the song. Pete Seeger wrote the song in the late 1950s, and Pete Seeger lifted the lyrics almost entirely from Ecclesiastes 3, penned by King Solomon in nearly a thousand years before Christ. So I'm not going to make reference to it for copyright reasons. Number two, I'm not going to make reference to the birds' song because the song completely misses the point of Ecclesiastes 3. The author's intent in the original poem is a far cry from what the birds sang in the 60s. And aside from the title, Turn, 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 the only change made from the text to the King James Version is the last line of the song, where they add, I swear it's not too late. After Solomon says there's a time of war and a time for peace. They wrenched Solomon's words from their context and they recast their meaning in order to peddle a popular peacenik protest sing-along during an unpopular American war. And now I'm afraid we probably tend to misinterpret Solomon because the bird's version of his poem is in our heads along with that irritatingly catchy melody. So I will definitely not be referring to that song this morning. The words are ripped off and ripped out. How did they miss Solomon's point so badly, you ask? Well, Ecclesiastes 3 
is not about figuring out what time I should do various activities. No, Ecclesiastes 3 is all about the meticulous sovereignty of God. It's not a time management jingle. It is, in fact, descriptive of the way God orders the universe. These are not prescriptions. These are describing the various events that happen in life. Not telling us when or how I should do various things. Not the wisest way to organize my life. But that God is exhaustively sovereign over every single detail of life. What we see in Ecclesiastes 3 are God's times. Not man's times. I'll show you this, and I'll give you a number of reasons here for seeing it this way. This is not the outline for our message today. This is still part of the introduction. In verse 1, Solomon tells us there is an appointed time. English Standard Version says a season. In other words, this is not something that man comes up with. This is something ordained. Secondly, notice in verse 1, he says, under heaven. There's an appointed time for everything. There's a time for every event under heaven. This is different than Solomon's familiar refrain, under the sun. He's been using it over and over and over again. These are not synonymous phrases in Ecclesiastes. Under the sun depicts a horizontal human perspective of our world and its happenings. Under heaven, on the other hand, occurs three times in Ecclesiastes, and each time it refers to God being the one orchestrating things. He is the one who looks down upon our world and its happenings. A third reason to see these are as God's times is verse 11. At the conclusion of the poem, Solomon himself tells us what it's about. He says, God has made everything beautiful in its time. And he says also in verse 11, this is God's work. There need be no debate about Solomon's meaning. He just tells us exactly what he means. And notice in this passage, there are no injunctions. No commands to sort of figure out when to do the various things we should be doing. There are no promises, no blessings given if we get the timing just right. We're not told to do anything about these times. They just are. Fifthly, notice the kinds of happenings that are listed. Birth and death, for instance. These are not schedulable events. Of course, these are appointments that all of us must keep, but you can't put them in your day timer and have any, any confidence that you can accomplish them whenever you like. And no one schedules a, a real cry or a genuine laugh. These things just happen. Sixthly, Solomon gives us no moral assessments, no ethical assessments of these happenings. He doesn't give us any value judgments concerning the events listed in the poem. Uh, There's not a list of do's and don'ts. We might expect some valuation of them, some explanation of their relative merits if we're supposed to figure out what to do and when to do it. And then finally, there's no instructions given for any of these. You know, the best time to have a garage sale is a cool, dry Saturday morning in the fall. No, he just says there are times where you keep things and times where you throw them away. These are all descriptions of things that just happen in life. And they happen, according to verse 11, because God places them all as he sees fit. What is this passage all about? I have it for you up here on the screen. God's beautiful, meticulous orchestration of every event of life and how we're supposed to feel about it. God's beautiful, meticulous orchestration of every event in life And how we are to feel about it. That's what we're looking at this morning. The first portion of that is the first eight verses. It's the poem itself. And we'll call this reflecting on the sovereignty of God. And we'll read verse 1 again. There is an appointed time for everything. And there is a time for every event under heaven. This is Solomon's introduction to 28 happenings given in 14 pairs. It's kind of a staccato grammatically. They're all infinitives if you care about that kind of thing. And it's just one after another. Statement after statement after statement. And there's a back and forth between sort of polar opposites in each one of these pairings. It's, it's kind of like the tick and talk of a clock incessantly ticking and talking over and over again. It, it might even be compared to the inhaling and exhaling of a human breathing, the rhythm of life. The pairings of these events are important. 
We might like for life to be all about peace and love and birthdays and gardens and building things and laughing and dancing and embracing. But life is not all puppy dogs and unicorns. I don't know why I picked unicorns. You and I need to remember where and when we find ourselves. East of Eden, after the fall, kicked out of the garden because of the man. We are all sons of the man, sons of the Adam. And we live in a broken world. We are sinful creatures walking God's green earth, which has been cursed by God, so that we, sinful, rebellious creatures, don't make our home here. The fact that delightful things occur here, the fact that enjoyable things can happen to us, is a remarkable kindness and a demonstration of the patience of the one who is orchestrating all of it. The psalm begins with his first illustration, and really all of these are illustrations of the point. God is weaving together the tapestry of life He's in charge of all of these things. These are in his time. The first is birth and death. He starts with the two most momentous events of our existence. When you come into the world, when you go out of the world. And perhaps you know the unspeakable joy at the birth of a child. Or maybe you know the indescribable pain at the loss of a loved one. And you yourself did not get to pick the moment of the beginning of your existence just like you don't get to choose the moment you leave this world. This truth is reflected elsewhere in Scripture. Psalm 139, the psalmist writes, Your eyes, O God, have seen my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as of yet there was not one of them. In Hebrews 9, 27, It is appointed for man to die once and then to face judgment. I'm intrigued by the story of Ahab the wicked king of the northern tribes of Israel. You can read about him in 2 Kings 22. God had told Ahab through the prophet Micaiah that he was going to die in battle. How would you like to wake up in the morning and hear that you're going to die that day? What would you do? If you were King Ahab, you would probably do what he did. He, he took his royal garments and he placed them on the other king, uh, the king of Jerusalem. He thought maybe he could, if he put his clothes on Jehoshaphat, then the enemy would target him and kill him instead. That, not a nice friend. Not a good ally to have in war. The king of Aram was told only to fight with Ahab. Of course, Ahab's in plain clothes, and the guy that looks like Ahab doesn't get hit. But one of the enemy soldiers pulled back his bow at random and just let an arrow fly. <laughs> Where did that arrow go? Right into the chink of his armor and killed him. And the irony of the story goes even deeper. He ended up actually not bleeding out there, but bleeding out in his chariot as his chariot took him to the very spot where God said he would die. All of these things are in God's hands. What we see, what we experience, we we tend to think that we're captains of our own fate and in charge of the things around us. God's in charge of all of these things. And death is such a lamentable tragedy, and it doesn't matter how someone gets there. To die at the hands of an unjust sinner, to die as the consequence of your own actions, when a person dies unexpectedly in a calamity or some natural disaster, or when a person dies at the end of a long physical struggle with an illness, all of it is tragic. And when death rears its ugly head, every, everything in you wants to cry out, no, can we just take it back? Can I get a do-over? Can we, can we rewind? Can I have just a few more moments or one more conversation? Martin Luther said, you cannot live any longer than the Lord has prescribed, nor die any sooner. Solomon moves on to your garden, a time to plant and a time to uproot. Vegetables, and trees, whole forests experience the comings and goings of life, often at the hands of people who pluck them out or put them in the ground, but always under the meticulous sovereignty of God. 
Another illustration in verse 3, a time to kill and a time to heal. Solomon here again is just illustrating life in a fallen world populated by sinful creatures who murder each other and build hospitals. He's not making moral assessments here. Just stating the reality in a fallen world. In verse 3, also, you have a time to tear down and a time to build up. September 11th, 2001, two great towers were brought to rubble by a handful of madmen. And this week, all across this valley, new buildings are going up everywhere you look. He describes a time to weep and a time to laugh. You can't make those things up. Genuine weeping and genuine laughter just happen in response to the varying colors of life's events. Janet and I were given tickets to a symphony a number of years ago. And we got all dressed up. I had my suit coat on, and it was allergy season in Middle Tennessee, and I was a victim. And right at the most quiet point of this beautiful orchestrated piece, you know the oboe solo where everybody else goes quiet and and you could hear any rustling of fingertips in a massive auditorium. And if you've heard me sneeze, you just know this isn't going to end well. I've tried the <gasps> that people do. I, it hurts. It's physically impossible, frankly, for me. And so what am I going to do? This sneeze is coming. I'm trying to swallow and choke it down. And I thought, well, I'll just sneeze into my coat and, and try to close everything up as much as possible. And the most horrific, squeaking, <laughs> awful sound bellowed through the entire orchestral hall. And the glares, the dirty looks, the venom that was aimed at us was palpable. Of course, our response was not to be ashamed, but to laugh until we cried. And, you know, the shoulders are going, we're trying to be quiet, and we just can't stop laughing. To, so to, to sneeze and to laugh and to cry all at the same time, these are just the happenings of life. Solomon illustrates with a time to mourn and a time to dance. You don't typically dance and mourn at the same time. Again, these are extremes. I think the intention of Solomon is to paint the picture that on this end and this end, God is in charge and everything in between. They're all according to his times. He says in verse 5, there's a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. Tour guides in Israel will usually tell a joke that goes something like this. God gave stones to an angel, and his job was to distribute them over the whole earth, but the angel tripped over Palestine and spilled them all there. Places full of rocks. And what is this idea of throwing stones and gathering stones? Uh, it could be a reference to something like 2 Kings 3.19. Uh, you can look it up later, but uh, if you wanted to do harm to an enemy, you would fill his fields, meant for cultivating food, fill it with rocks, because then he couldn't use it couldn't eat. It was a, a way to do damage to an enemy. And to gather stones would be to collect stones out of a field in order that the field would be cultivated so that you'd have stones then to build a wall or build terraced areas for watering things or to build buildings. There's a time for both. In God's economy, there's a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. Verse 5, this may be a reference to physical love and marriage. There's a time to search and a time to give up as lost, verse 6. You know, when you're searching for something, you still have hope that maybe just around the next corner, I'm going to find what or whom I'm looking for. And to give up as lost is to surrender hope. It's just part of what happens in this life. In verse 6, there's a time to keep and a time to throw away. There's the joy of acquisition and there's the joy of throwing it in the trash. <laughs> there's a time to tear apart and a time to sew together. Probably a reference to tearing your clothes in lament and sorrow the way Reuben did when he went to the pit where they'd thrown Joseph and he couldn't find him. Or the way Jacob did when he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and mourned for his son many days when he thought that he was killed. To sew together is to take those rent, those torn garments, and sew them back up together. Not because you wanted to wear something that looked like it came from the thrift store, 
but as an actual demonstration that you were ready to celebrate, that even though there had been pain in the past, that you've sewn that back up together and you're wearing that garment as a demonstration that joy has returned. In verse 7, he describes a time to be silent and a time to speak. You know this. There are times when words flow freely and there are times when you can't find the words at all. A time to love and a time to hate. Listen, to love and to feel loved is a remarkable gift of God's kindness to us and our relationships here. But to hate, to actually feel hatred for someone else or to feel hatred from someone else is awful, gut-wrenching, isolating. He says there's a time for war and a time for peace. This, of course, began with Satan's war against God's image bearers and humanity in the Garden of Eden. It was evidenced in Cain's murder of his brother shortly thereafter. And has continued ever since. And sometimes wars result from irreconcilable disagreements between peoples and nations. Most often, wars are waged by tyrants with a lust for power and prominence, employing the terrible technologies at their disposal to destroy their enemies, to gain ground, to gain prestige. Sometimes wars are thrust upon unsuspecting peoples, the way Kuwait was overrun by Saddam Hussein, or the way European nations were overrun by Adolf Hitler. Sometimes a nation goes to war with itself. Where a president, through tears, calls for conflagration to end the evil of slavery. No matter the cause, war is always awful. It's awful. Solomon here is not presenting a just war theory. He's simply describing war as another reality of life in a fallen world under the sovereign hand of God. I'm reminded of our own war, the war we were all born in, the war in which we were all combatants, that we fought because we wanted to, and our enemy was God. Remember Paul's description of you before you were a believer? You were at enmity with him. But by the blood of his cross, he made peace. God, the one who is most wronged, (laughs) the innocent party in the grand conflict, put his own son on a cross as a peace offering to reconcile warring factions. So you have this amazing declaration in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been declared righteous on the basis of faith, we possess peace with God. A remarkable statement. When we read that, we often don't think well enough or deeply enough about the war we were in before God granted us peace. In fact, I don't think we realized we we were at war until God made peace. For when you realize for the first time that you were a sinner and that you had offended a holy God, but that God himself was willing to take all of your crimes and place them on his son as an innocent substitute to crush him in your place... Then and only then did you realize, I've been at war with God, and I want to be no longer. And God is the initiator, the beginner of peace. He's the only one who who could accomplish it. And for all of us who believe, this cessation of hostilities came through the most heinous, most violent, most awful, single, tragic unjust event that has ever taken place. Jesus Christ, the righteous, killed in the place of the guilty so that we go free. I hope you know this peace. For the Christian, this is the best peace for it is the lasting peace. Let's remember for a moment, who really understood time and the appropriate times for various events. 
Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us at the cross. Romans 5, 6, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Solomon's poem here is not a prescription for us to get our time management under order, <laughs> but to recognize God's management of the times. Know this, the Prince of Peace himself is coming to this world to establish his shalom, his right-making peace and he's coming to make war to bring it about. And for all those who belong to him, who is the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6, we have him and forever have our security in him. But for all those who reject the Prince of Peace, my friends, you will never have peace, though you search for it all your life in this earth, in this world, during time, and though you long for it for all of eternity, you will never have it because you can only have it through him. If this passage, if this poem of Solomon's is all about a reflection on the sovereignty of God, what are we to do with this? Verses 9 to 11 gives us a, a response to the sovereignty of God. How should we respond to God's meticulous ordering, care, and ordaining of all events, past, present, and future of universal history? I want you to think of yourself for a moment as an ant. Six legs, little antenna. And you're crawling across a great grand surface. It's a canvas, a giant canvas. And there are various colors on this canvas, colors of every hue in, in some sort of a uh, discombobulated fashion that you do not recognize. In fact, uh, the paint is so big, the canvas is so big that you trip over the brush strokes. You're befuddled by the, the coloring. You're, you're standing on brown and, and you don't know what it means. You, you might think the whole universe is brown. And then 20 years of crawling across this canvas and you come to another color and it's burnt sienna. <laughs> you think, what's this doing here? This doesn't make any sense. I thought the universe was brown. 20 more years of crawling and you come to bright yellow and then green. And you think, what? what is all of this? The colors, the the events of life are the brush strokes of a great master painter. And the variations of life portray the panoply of pigments from the painter's prodigious palette. He is making a giant painting. And you, the ant, crawling across the enormous canvas, have no idea what it paints. Yet crawl you must. Maybe you've looked closely at a high-resolution digital photograph. There, it's not brush strokes, but pixels. <laughs> Can you imagine getting a high-resolution photograph of the Grand Canyon? And, again, being an ant on a blow-up of this image, standing on two or three pixels and trying to figure it out. Some of us ants crawl across the pictures or, or pixels or uh, stumble over the brush strokes and we think, oh, I know what this is all about. I got this. I know what's going on here. And others of us say, is there any rhyme? Any reason to this conglomeration of experiences? To the cacophony of joys and sorrows, grievous pains and sweet delights that make up this life? Is it random chance or cruel fate? So Solomon asked the question, look at verse 9. This is sort of the first layer of response to the meticulous sovereignty of God. What profit? Again, back to that question in chapter 1, verse 3. What's the takeaway? What do I gain? What's the leftover when all is said and done? Verse 9, he says, what profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? Again, you labor all of your life, and the ant 
toilsomely walking across this canvas. You go, for what? (laughs) What's unique about this question here, though, unlike the other questions Solomon has posed before, is this one is not rhetorical. This one does not demand the negative answer we become used to in Ecclesiastes. We almost expect to know what the next word is, right? Hevel. Vanity. Emptiness. And then for Solomon to say, it's a chasing after the wind. Notice in verse 9, he does not answer it that way. This question has an answer, and it's different than the ones that have gone before. We are not left to answer, there's no prophet. There is, in fact, a very purposeful, meaningful answer to this question. There's a temptation for us to answer the question something like this. I'm a puppet pinned in a pre-planned program. Why should I do anything? Have you ever thought that way? If God is sovereign, then what am I, a robot? It's a logical question. It's not an unfounded question. It's not an unreasonable question. But it misunderstands God's sovereignty. If you want an illustration of that, I would encourage you to maybe read this afternoon, Genesis chapter 20. Abraham is sort of meandering around with Sarah, and he comes into Abimelech's kingdom. And Abimelech takes Sarah into his household, right? Abraham was scared. She's really pretty. Uh, Somebody's just going to take her, so I'll just say she's my sister. Listen, not a good plan. Abimelech takes her into his household but doesn't touch her. God comes to Abimelech in a dream at night and says, Abimelech, you're a dead man because the woman in your house is married. And Abimelech says, God, in the integrity of my heart, I have not touched her. And God's response to Abimelech, who did not feel like a robot, by the way, who did exactly what he wanted to do, (laughs) did exactly what he felt like doing, Didn't feel like a puppet that somebody was pulling the strings. God responds to Abimelech this way. He says, I know that in the integrity of your heart you did what you did. However, I did not let you touch her. Isn't that interesting? Behind the scenes of all those captains of their own fates is a sovereign God who's in charge of everything, making sense of the cacophony of experiences that this life is. And listen to to the believer, that is a tremendous comfort. That's not always comforting. But we have to pay attention to the answer Solomon is driving us at. Remember the theme of Ecclesiastes that you cannot enjoy life until you choose to enjoy God. That's the answer he's driving us toward. This is a piece of that puzzle. Look at verse 10. Solomon says, I have seen the task which God has given to the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. So instead of answering the question, to what profit? He he doesn't say, nothing, it's meaningless. He says instead, no, there's a task given by God and I've seen it. There's something for us to do in response to God's inscrutable sovereignty. In view of all the inexplicable combinations of experiences of life, there's a task And it's a gift from God. Literally, God has given this task to the sons of Adam, the sons of the man. All those who are suffering under the curse and the fall and the effects of sin, there's a task for you with which to occupy yourselves. What is our great occupation, sons of Adam, daughters of Eve? What is our job as we crawl across the canvas of life, stumbling over the brush strokes of a giant painting we don't understand, that we can't put together, that we can't zoom out far enough to comprehend? What is our job? It's in verse 11. It is to look up, long for eternity, and feel small. That's our job. Look what Solomon says there. God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. Notice, he made everything, and the New American Standard says, appropriate in its time. That's okay, that, that word appropriate. God set it everywhere that it should be. But the Hebrew word there is the word for beautiful. And it has to do with what the eye perceives and delights in. To look at any one pixel on this picture of life might not tell us this is beautiful. In fact, it probably won't. 
but there's a painting being painted by a grand master. There's a picture being conveyed by the whole that Solomon says, by God's design, is beautiful. It's beautiful. The he in verse 10 is none other than God. This is a declaration on Solomon's part of faith and worship and trust. If life is to be compared to some grand tapestry, the pattern on the top, but we live underneath and all you see are the little strings and it doesn't seem to make sense, what are we to do? Trust beneath the tapestry. This is a statement of confidence that the master of the canvas knows what he is painting and it is beautiful. One pastor 150 years ago said, the wise and regular and orderly administration of one who sees the end from the beginning and to whom there is no unanticipated contingency, whose omniscient eye in the midst of whatever appears to us inextricable confusion has a thorough and intuitive perception of the endlessly diversified relations and circumstances discerning throughout the whole perfection of harmony. If you have no idea what I just said and you want me to email it to you later, just let me know. (laughs) In everything in life, God is weaving together something that he says is beautiful and right. And he knows everything. And with him, there are no contingencies, no what ifs, no plan B. God's meticulous sovereignty over all events, according to Solomon, is beautiful. And we'll look at this next time we're together in verse 14. Solomon continues the declaration of God's sovereignty and all the awful things that happen in a world under his care. And he says that plan in verse 14 cannot be improved upon. Ecclesiastes 3.11 is the Romans 8.28 of the Old Testament, right? And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. This is great comfort in a confusing world. We have to be honest for a moment and say that not everybody is comforted by such thoughts. The thought that a sovereign God orchestrating every detail of human existence... The humanist would not call that beautiful at all. Uh, The creature who is set on being the captain of his own soul and the master of his own fate doesn't like the idea of someone else being in control. The idea of surrendering his self-styled sovereignty to some imagined deity is likened to being the passenger seat of a car on a freeway with the accelerator fixed at 90 miles an hour and a four-year-old at the wheel. I could do a much better job controlling this vehicle right now. And he desperately wants the controls. So he declares himself that there is no God. That he himself can determine his destiny. That no one will receive the credit or the blame for the results of his existence. But listen. If you really are the captain of your own soul. If you really are the master of your own fate. Then fix the Havel. Fix the frustration. Eliminate the vanity. Eradicate the meaninglessness of it all. Bend the universe to your own will. Cheat death. William Ernest Henley, the one who authored that poem Invictus that I read earlier, he wrote it after having his leg amputated following complications from tuberculosis. Having recovered, although without a leg, he wrote the poem Unconquered, I win. However, Henley died at age 53, succumbing to the reality that he was, in fact, not the captain, not the master. The one who is the master, the one who is sovereign, the one who is Lord, has graciously done something for humanity. That humanity in its rebellion chooses to miss, but can't miss entirely. It's there in verse 11. Notice what Solomon says. God has also set eternity in their heart. Literally, he gave eternity to be in their hearts. 
That is, you and I may be bound by time, but we are built for eternity. And we know it. We have a built-in awareness of transcendence. We were made for something beyond this life, beyond the grave. You and I have an ingrained impulse to worship things bigger than ourselves, to explore our world, to ponder our existence, to contemplate the past and the present and the future, to yearn for something beyond us, to investigate our place in the cosmos. That is programmed within us. C.S. Lewis, in his series of essays titled Weight of Glory, he said, it is something like the scent of a flower we have not yet found, the echo of a tune we have not yet heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. He goes on to say in Mere Christianity, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that doesn't prove the universe is a fraud, but probably that earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. That's right. You wonder why God is kind to a rebellious humanity and gives rain in its season and sunshine in its season. Opportunity to hold a newborn baby and smell the top of his head. Opportunities to eat a delightful meal or have enjoyable friendships. Why does God do this to creatures like us? Because God wants to give us a flavor of the joy and satisfaction and meaning and purpose we were built for but can't have after the fall, outside of the garden, until we are reconciled to him through his son, Jesus Christ. And so even though we were built for eternity and these vibrations of eternity resonate in the heart of every human being, and, and it's man's rebellion that suppresses it, but every man feels it, yet the solution to it is elusive. Look how Solomon concludes verse 11. Yet, there's eternity in the heart. God's made everything beautiful, yet he's done it so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. There's a limitation to our yearning. We might want to know everything about the universe around us. We might want to know the answers from beginning to end. We might want to be able to paint the whole picture ourselves, and God will not let us. (laughs) These things go unanswered in this life. Ask Job. He didn't get to sort out the the joys and the griefs that he experienced. He didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. He didn't get to zoom out and see the whole canvas. Nor do we. Solomon, who tried harder than anyone to search it out, concludes that life is too big, the canvas is too vast, the details are too complex for us to see it all and understand it while we crawl across its surface. So what does Solomon do? trusts. He rejoices. Here, the smartest guy in the world, the most inquisitive guy who wasn't going to be satisfied until he learned everything is satisfied here when he does not know the answer. And he calls it beautiful. Listen, don't wait to declare God's painting beautiful until you can see it all. He's sovereign and he's good. Now, what do we know from Scripture? That we can trust Him in the complexities of life in a fallen world. We can know that He is in control and that He is good. That He's orchestrating everything for our absolute and eternal best. That every pixel has its place. Every brush stroke in the grand canvas of life is purposeful and beautiful in its time. All of it contributing to the great and glorious end that God has designed for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. For the godly, eternity is a day that has no sunset. That's what Solomon is driving us toward. And if you think this morning that you are still the captain of your own soul, the master of your own fate, you must know that eternity is a night which has no sunrise for those who don't know him. Would you turn to him today? Have life and have everything? 
As one writer said, I have found more in Christ than I ever hoped to be pleased by, that I ever knew that I could have pleasure in. I found it all and more in him. Let's pray. Oh God, we are humbled this morning by your meticulous sovereignty, by your detailed ordering of all events. We recognize that we are small. We recognize this morning that we do not understand what you're up to. We can't see it from beginning to end. But oh God, we trust you. And often we don't trust you very well. We believe and help our unbelief. No doubt everyone here in this room this morning, oh God, who is loved by you, has felt the pains of life in a fallen world and also experiences the joys of knowing you. Would you be our rock, our comfort, our anchor for all the days you give us left on this earth? We know that time is a fragment of eternity given by you as a solemn stewardship. May we use each fleeting moment for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name.